Well, let's, uh, let's start with a little simple task, actually a drawing task. Um, if you have your programs, uh, you could pull out your programs on the back of your programs. or the second to the last page, you'll see a simple little spiral drawing. It looks, a, looks like this. If you don't have this uh, spiral drawing, you could draw on any piece of paper or you have a smartphone or a tablet, you could download the app tonight and do it. Let's just take a pen, and you can put it right on the center dot of the spiral, and you can trace your way out of the spiral without touching it. If you really want to add a little complexity, don't let your hand rest on the piece of paper. You can just, just let the pen, the pen touch the paper. This, this is my spiral uh, earlier today, and we use this sometimes to uh, look for evidence of tremor. Um, I'm not sure how many of you see tremor in your spiral drawing. How many of you have tremor? We ha actually, we all have tremor. Everybody's got it. So all human beings, it's ubiquitous with us. Uh, we all have degrees of, small degree of physiologic tremor. That's normal. If we looked at your hands under a microscope, they do oscillate a little bit. If you drink a few espressos before you come in here, we could see it. Or if you stay up all night, we could see it. But uh, what if your spiral drawing looked like this? This is, um, you could drop the lights. This is a spiral drawing from one of our patients with a condition called essential tremor. It's a tremor condition that's uh, not normal. Um, it's actually the most common movement disorder. It affects five to 10 million Americans. And we all have heard of Parkinson's disease. That affects another one to two million Americans. Uh, this problem can cause a lot of uh, disabilities at home and in the workplace. The spiral drawing is really just kind of the tip of the iceberg. Can we play the video? This is what it lo actually looks like. You might say, what sloppy handwriting or sloppy drawings, that's not the biggest deal. But a tremor can look very benign um, kind of to, to us in day-to-day -day life. But... When people start to use their uh, hands for some of the basic activities, the basic simple things that we do every day, you can see how it can get in the way of these things. Sometimes the more you concentrate, the worse it gets. Just trying to sign your name, something that's so important to kind of authenticate everything that you do. Pouring a glass of uh, water or a cup of coffee can be really difficult. And then obviously eating and uh, using your hands can be very difficult. Um, so I'm a, I'm a neurosurgeon uh, at the university. I specialize actually in operations and surgeries um, for chronic neurologic problems like tremor or Parkinson's disease. And we've come a long way. If you had a severe tremor and you went to have surgery 50 or 60 years ago, you might have had a part of your brain removed by the surgeon, as you can see in the upper left corner. Then we developed some uh, more complex uh, devices to insert probes deep into the brain to cause holes or ablations uh, in the tremor circuits. And now, as you can see in the bottom right, we have very sophisticated uh, devices for stimulating some of these circuits or inhibiting them. And these, uh, these new modern techniques can be extremely effective for alleviating some of these problems like tremor and Parkinson's disease. But all of these procedures uh, share one thing in common, and that is that they all require open brain surgery. And you really have to ask yourself, is this really the way that we're going to do it in 20 years from now or even 10 years from now? There has to be a way that we could reach inside the brain without opening it up the skull and the, and the brain. So a few years ago, I learned about ultrasound. Um, ultrasound is acoustic energy. It's sound waves. It's uh, sonar for submarines or radar for bats and other things. It's, uh, it's energy uh, that's, a, that's sound waves that are above the frequency for human hearing. And that's why we call it ultrasound. So ultrasound's used every day. We all know someone that's had an ultrasound or we've had one ourselves. You can ultrasound your chest to look at your heart or your abdomen to look at your gallbladder. Or you may ultrasound your pelvis to look at uh, some of these little uh, miracles that we see every day, um, like my kids. 
who have grown up to be a lot bigger. But we've never used a lot of ultrasound for the brain because of uh, uh, one reason, and that's our skulls. The skulls impede the transmission of acoustic energy and sound waves. Some of us also have thicker skulls than others. <laughs> so uh, through some really incredible uh, engineering achievements in this past decade, we've, we've gained the ability to send sound waves through the skull. And so some of the ultrasound transducers can now shift or phase shift the ultrasound waves so that they can deflect appropriately through the skull and deep into the brain. And we also now have the ability to not just focus one ultrasound beam, but several of them or a thousand of them, like a magnifying glass deep inside the brain, not just to visualize it, but to treat, treat something. And we've, we could couple this um, technology to another technology, MRI. MRI is the most sophisticated device that we have today to image the brain and look at the deep brain structures. This MRI is, uh, is capable of kind of monitoring the ultrasound treatment, not just the location of the treatment, but the intensity. So it's really an a incredible safety mechanism to watch a treatment while we deliver it deep inside the brain. So um, my partner, Neil Cassell, told me about some of the first ultrasound, focused ultrasound treatments that were being uh, conducted uh, a few years ago. They were actually even patients with brain tumors. They were trying to ablate the brain tumors. And I thought about our tremor problem. Um, after all, you know, tremor is a problem that involves an abnormal circuit deep inside the brain. And I thought this would be the perfect solution for our, our tremor problem. So uh, we went back to UVA and assembled a, a large team of engineers and scientists and clinicians. We got all the regulatory permissions. Uh, we uh, got the device and tested it and calibrated it, spent several, a couple of years designing a clinical trial. And finally, in 2011, we treated 15 very brave patients with essential tremor who had very severe debilitating tremors. And as you can see on this MRI, we were able to focus the ultrasound beams, a thousand of them, deep inside the brain to make a treatment about the size of a grain of rice. And what's really most important is the clinical result. So these patients, all 15 of them had uh, improvement in their tremor, about a 75% improvement across the group. And what's more important is that if we could improve someone's tremor by 75%, especially in their dominant hand, they, could, they would realize incredible improvements in their day-to-day -day activities, the functional activities that we use all the time. Uh, all the time throughout the day, things like feeding yourself, riding, brushing your teeth. These patients had almost no disabilities after we uh, suppressed their tremor that much. And I think a picture is worth a thousand words. One of my colleagues uh, would say a tremor control like this would allow the person to drink a full glass of red wine on a brand new white carpet. This is how it looks. Um, can we play both the videos? If you'll remember, this is one of them is the before video. A uh, little bit of tremor in the dom is a left-handed patient with the dominant hand tremor. Uh, looks benign when we do the bedside testing, but you can see the disability that it can cause when we start to do some of the functional activities of day-to-day -day acti day -day living. And if you look on the right, you'll see how smooth we really suppress his tremor and he's got a very smooth control with his drawings and, and pourings. So this is an experimental treatment. We, this is our, our early results have been very positive and it's uh, prompted us to uh, organize a larger clinical trial which is now being conducted around the, around the world at several centers across the globe. And our group as well as several other groups are starting to study other problems like Parkinson's disease and epilepsy and psychiatric problems like OCD. So this is uh, probably just the tip of the iceberg for a new um, a, a, a new technology. 
And so I'm not saying that focused ultrasound is going to be the answer for all medical or uh, neurological problems. But if it's applied in the right uh, situation, it could be a very elegant, simple solution uh, for a specific problem. And I think this kind of challenges us. The world is changing so fast that there are lots of new things happening to us every day, things we're exposed to that are new. And we ought to really reevaluate and critically uh, uh, review uh, some of the old problems that we have and use some of these new uh, applications. Thank you.